All right, here in chapter number 32. Now, you remember last week, there was a chapter where Jacob leaves Laban, and he's fleeing away from him, and Laban comes back, and he's all angry with him because he left. And, um, you know, Jacob dealt with that whole thing. He kind of pacified him, and, and you know, they were, at, they were at odds with each other. But then they made their, their, their vow that, you know, they're not going to pass over to each other to, to hurt each other. And so he j Jacob just gets done dealing with that drama, with that strife with his family, with Laban, with his wife's family, right? Now he's heading over into something that's, that's probably even more dangerous with Esau. Now you remember the whole reason why Jacob left in the first place, left because he's going back to like his father's land. And this is what God has called him back to do. And he's been gone for 20 years. He served seven years for each of his wives, and then he served another six years for all that cattle and everything else that he's leaving with now. So he's been gone for 20 years. And the reason why he left, you remember, um, ultimately is because Esau was so angry that Jacob deceived Isaac, and he received that blessing that Esau wanted to kill him. Now, back then, they thought that Isaac was just ready to die, right? That's why Isaac gave them their blessings and everything else, but Isaac is still alive at this point. It's been 20 years later, and Isaac is still around. But the one, you know, that was one of the reasons why he fled was because, the main reason is because Esau was ready to kill him. He was like, as, as, soon, as, you know, as soon as the days of mourning are done, I'm killing, I'm killing Jacob. And, but then the other reason, because Rebecca knew this, and she wanted him to go and to find a wife. So she also, they sent him away for that purpose as well, to get a wife from, um, of the house of Abraham, basically from uh, Nahor, from Rebecca's family. But, um, so he left, now he's headed back, and now he's got this problem to deal with, right? So let's, see, let's start off in verse number one, let's start reading this chapter. The Bible reads, And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Now, this is really interesting because these first two verses, they almost seem out of place. Because you look at this and be like, why is God just bringing up that he sees this, the angels? Like he, just, he sees God's angels and he says, oh, and he calls this place Mahanaim. And then the story just continues on about everything else. And there's a bunch of things that are interesting about Nothing is in the Bible by accident. I believe um, there's many reasons why this is here. The reason why I was kind of given that, that intro is to help us know where we're at in the Bible, obviously, when we're going through this. But to express the everything that Jacob's dealing with, it's, it's not an easy time for Jacob, right? It's a lot of persecution and turmoil and just unrest, and he's got problems, like strives with family and everything else going on. And God has told him to go and do this, right? God has told him to go back into his land, and God has made these promises to him, and God's been in communication with Jacob. So what I believe, the reason why Jacob even is allowed to see this, because we know that, that angels are spiritual beings. And turn, if you would, just to Hebrews real quick. I mentioned this a little bit in my sermon, or quite a bit in my sermon on um, the psychics and witchcraft and sorcery and, and that uh, about a week or two ago on Sunday. And um, we went over this concept of how you know, I believe angels are spiritual beings. They exist. They're real. And, you know, there's that concept of the guardian angel. And the concept is biblical because God has given his angels to be watching over and protecting us. Look at, look at Hebrews chapter 1, and I just want you to see this real quick. Let's start reading in um, verse number 6. Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible reads, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he said, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, so he's saying about the angels, and of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, That throne of God is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. And he goes on about Jesus. But right here we see that the angels are spirits, 
and they're ministers. They're, they're sent to minister. And then jump down to verse number 13. A lot of people will say, oh, the angels are the sons of God. Verse number 13 says, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make that enemy thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And who are the heirs of salvation? That's us, right? They're sent to minister unto us, those that, that shall be heirs of salvation. We are the heirs when we're born again, when we're born into God's family, we receive an inheritance. We receive the inheritance that Jesus Christ bought and paid for with his blood. We receive that inheritance when our spirit is born again. And that's what the angels are. They're ministering spirits. There's a spiritual realm. There's spiritual beings. And we don't always see what's going on with that in that spiritual world, but we know that they're there. We know that that you know the archangel Michael withstood Satan, and we know that there's a lot of things going on that we don't actually get to see. But Jacob sees this. He sees these angels. If you remember a few chapters earlier when we're when um, Jacob was going into the land before he got married, before he even found Laban. He saw the angels of God ascending and descending upon that ladder into heaven. So this isn't the first time that, that Jacob has been allowed to see these angels. Like I said earlier, I believe they're all around us. And God has, has let him witness this, I believe, to let him know that God is with him and that you know angels are there for our protection and that Jacob can feel more confident and more safe. I brought this story up earlier in that other sermon about Elisha and his servant when they got surrounded by the, by the Syrian army and they had these chariots and horses and horsemen and everything else surrounded them against these two guys. Yeah. And his servant's like, what are we going to do? Like, like, we're toast. There's nothing we can do. I mean, we are completely surrounded, and it's an entire army, and there's two of us. And that's when Elisha prays to God. He says, you know, open up his eyes. He opens up his eyes, and he sees all of the, this, this whole camp of angels surrounding them, right? And, and they are in ready to protect them and ready to defeat these, this other army that's come against them. And that's their job, and that's what God has given them to do. And especially a man like Elisha, you know, a, a great man of God, the more you do for God, I believe, the more he's willing to look out and for, to protect you and send more angels to be there to take guard because the more you're doing for God, the more you're going to have people attacking you and coming against you and even dark forces, spiritual forces coming against you to get you to stop, to get you to quit, to silence you, to hurt you, whatever they can do. We can have the faith to know that God is looking out for us and his angels can are sent to minister and to protect us as well. We see that in various stories. And I think this is the reason why Jacob is sees these, these angels. Because otherwise it doesn't really fit in with the story very much. But when you understand everything that he's going through and what he's about to face, he doesn't know at this point you know, what his brother's going to do. The last he knew, his brother wanted to kill him. And now he's headed back that way. And what he's doing, though, he's going back by faith. I'm sure if it were up to Jacob, he would probably never want to go back because he wouldn't want to have to face his brother. Because he wouldn't know if his brother's going to want to kill him. If it were up to him, he'd probably be happy just, just staying there or, you know, staying somewhere else but not going back. But God tells him, no, you need to go back to the promised land. You need to go back to the land of, of your fathers. And, um, and he obeys him. And he takes it on faith that that's what God wants him to do, so that's what he's going to do. Look at um, verse number 3. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau his brother unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my lord Esau. And look at his tone even. He says, because he's sending out his servants to kind of feel out what is Esau thinking, how is he going to react, how is he going to respond. So he sends a messenger before he, before he comes up and shows up in the town. He sends a messenger. And he says, Thus shall he speak unto my Lord Esau. So he's already beginning. Even as he's talking to his messenger, he's referring to Esau as my Lord. It's a, it's a real humble attitude. right? He's coming back meekly. He's not coming back and saying, like, Well, here I am. What are you going to do? You know, He's not coming back and saying, Oh, you're going to kill me now? You know, he doesn't have that type of an attitude. He's coming back very humbly, very meekly, ready to just to, to try to, to bury the hatchet, try to put things at peace with his brother. So he says, 
Thus shall he speak unto my Lord Esau, Thy servant Jacob saith thus. So this is what his messenger is supposed to say. Your servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now, and I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in thy sight. And what's grace? Grace is something that's undeserved, right? Something that you receive that, that you don't deserve. It's not based on your merit. He's looking to find grace and, and, and forgiveness in the eyes of Esau. And he tells him, look, you know, I've been gone this whole time. I've been to Laban. I've been staying there. I, I've accumulated wealth. I have all this stuff. You know, I don't need anything from you. I'm doing just fine. This is what I'm, I'm doing well, and, but I'm coming back, and I just, I just want to find grace in your eyes. So that's what he sends his messenger off to say. Look at verse number 9. It says, And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. Now, <laughs> we have the, the privilege, of, the benefit of knowing how the story ends and how everything goes, right? So, like, you got to put yourself in Jacob's shoes, though. He has no idea. So when he sends his messenger back, Matt, what in the world would you think when your brother wanted to kill you when you left? If he says, oh, yeah, well, he's coming out to meet you. Oh, and by the way, he's coming with 400 men. Think about 400 men. I mean, you probably don't even have 400 Facebook friends, <laughs> let alone 400 friends or whatever. You know, why in the world would he be bringing 400 people with him? 400 people sounds like an army, sounds like he's willing to take vengeance on his brother, right? I mean, that's the only rational thought that Jacob could come up with. And it makes sense why he would think that. So he's starting to get very worried. He's very concerned about this, as he should be. I mean, if he's coming, if he, if he came with no ill intent, with no harm at all, why would he have to bring so many people with him? You know, if he came with some of his friends or whatever, like a real small group, that would be one thing. It's not going to be threatening. But when you show up with 400 people, that's a whole other thing. So he says, um, so that's what his messengers say. So verse 7 says, Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Of course he was. And he divided the people that was with him, and the flocks and herds and the camels and the two bands. Now what's interesting about this is, and he said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. He doesn't turn back. This is really bad news for him. Really bad news. I mean, you can only think one thing when he's coming at him like that, right? There's only one logical explanation for that. If he was to lean on his own understanding and just to lean on his own wisdom, he would be confident that Esau is just going to kill him. He's going to kill his family. He's going to kill everybody because he's angry and that's why he's bringing 400 people. But what does he do? He continues going forward. Why? Because God commanded him to. Because Jacob had faith, and we're going to see that in a minute, his prayer to God. But he's also trying to be wise about this, so he splits up his family and everything into two groups. So he's saying, okay, if he comes at me, I mean, he's got to choose one or the other. It's going to be a loss either way, but if he comes at this group, okay, you guys get to flee away, and hopefully you'll be able to get away from him and run away and preserve your life. And if he comes at this group, you know, the other way. So he, he splits them up into two groups in case that were to happen. Look what it says in, uh, in verse number 9. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which says unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. So he goes to God. He's petitioning God now with, with, with safety. He's going to God. And I want, you, I want to take notice at how Jacob approaches God. Does he get angry and say, God, why are you telling me to do this? He's coming at me with 400 men. He doesn't get angry. He stays very, very humble. And we need to, we're going to go through this in a little bit of detail because this is something that we can learn in our own prayer life. 
when we go to God with things, when we want to speak to God, look at how Jacob approaches God. He starts off saying, oh God of my father Abraham, God of my Isaac. First he starts off saying, God, you told me this. He's quoting God's word back to him, right? Because that's what God did tell him. Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will do it well with thee. God, you told me to do this, and I'm doing this. And would to God your prayers could start out that way, saying, God, you told me this is what you wanted me to do with my life. This is, these are the actions you want me to take, and I'm doing it. Great way to start off a prayer. Saying, God, you said this. This is what your word says. And then he goes and, and shows his humility. In the next verse, verse 10, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. He's like, I'm not worthy of anything that you've already done for me unto this point. You have extended so much mercy. When, when he's, I'm sure he's thinking about all his deceivings and his trickeries and, and whatever other sins he's done. He's like, I'm not worthy of anything that you've done for me. The least of your mercies and of all the truth, everything that you've, you've shown unto me and the blessings that you've given me. He says, for with my staff, all he had when he left was a staff. He's like, all I had was a staff. With my staff, I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. He's like, I have two whole bands. I have enough to have two bands of substance, of things, of animals, of people, of everything else coming back with me. He went in empty. All he had was a staff, and he's leaving with all this stuff. So he's saying, look, I'm not worthy of any of this stuff. You have done so much for me. But you said this, you've done all of this for me, even though I don't deserve it. And then verse 11, deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with children. So he's explaining to God, God, look, I'm afraid. You've told me to do this and I'm doing it. And you've given me so much. But I'm afraid. I'm fearful, God. Please be with me. Please deliver me. And it's this humble attitude. And look what he says in verse 12. And thou saidst, again, he's bringing up God's word. And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the seed, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So basically, I mean, he's asking for some assurance here. He's saying, look, God, you promised this to me. My brother's coming to kill me. He's coming with an army. But you told me that you're going to do me good. You told me to come here. You told me to do this stuff. And honestly, this is the way that we ought to be able to pray to God. You ought to know your Bible. You ought to know what God's will is for your life. You ought to know that he wants you coming to church. He wants you, you know, preaching the gospel and just preaching his word and preaching the truth in general. And sometimes people and family members can come against you and can try to intimidate you or scare you. Or you might not recognize the situation just... From, from all of your wisdom that you have, it looks like it's not going to be good. It looks like there's this big war coming. It looks like there's going to be a lot of fighting. It's going to be really uncomfortable. And it starts to scare you. How you respond to that, that situation is critical. Don't turn back. Don't go back like the children of Israel wanted to go back into Egypt when they were being delivered through, from Egypt. When they'd already been delivered, they were wandering in the wilderness. And they kept on trying to go back and trying to look. Don't look back. We need to continue moving forward with what God has told us to do. And if you become fearful, if, when, when these things do arise, go to God humbly in prayer. Don't get angry at God. Don't get upset with God. God, God, how can you let this happen? We don't always know the reason. You don't have to question. And he's not questioning God of why is he letting this happen. He's, he's asking him just to deliver. He's saying, look... Save me from this, God. This is where I'm at. This is the situation. Because honestly, if God wanted to, he could have made sure. Would you mind plugging this in for me? He could have made sure that Esau didn't come with 400 people. He could have put it in his heart to just say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm fine. But that's not what happened. Right? So instead of Jacob being angry, upset, saying, why did, why did you make it happen this way? Right? Start questioning why are things happening the way they do. Accept the, the circumstances and the situation and just move forward with it and 
continue to go to God with your problems. Let's keep reading here. Though. So he, he prays to God. He says, look, you told me that this was going to happen. He says um, that you made this promise unto me. So that was his prayer unto God. And then in verse 13 it says, and he lodged there that same night and took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau, his brother. And it goes on and it lists all these things that he did. So he's saying, you know, he gets this idea. It's, it's a, actually a really wise thing to do. No, I don't In order to um, appease his brother's wrath. Now, I just noticed I have in my heart, there's a few, a few things here that I didn't, real, I didn't catch before about our prayer life. Let me just jump back to that real quick. I'm sorry, I was a little distracted by noticing that my, uh, my audio thing wasn't plugged in. So now we should have much better audio on the video. But um, turn if you would. I want you to turn here. Keep your finger in Genesis 32. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. Because there are, there are a couple other points. I just got a little distracted. There's a couple other points I wanted to hit on praying. Because when, when God says something, we can have confidence that what he said is true. And in, in, in like manner, we can have confidence when we pray to God, when we're going to him with our requests and our petitions. If it's according to his will, if it's, if it's, you know, if it's especially something from the Bible, hey, we can have co complete trust and confidence that that's right. And will hear us and will answer our prayer 100%. 1 John chapter 5, look at verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Again, you know, we could know our eternal life is there because it's in God, because it's a promise of God, because God has promised that to us. Verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of. We can go unto God boldly. We could go unto God, you know, boldly yet still with humility, right? Not full of pride, but we can still have boldness enough to go to God and, and know that he is right and true. And if we ask anything according to his will, he'll hear us. And he'll answer our prayers. Uh, flip, if you would, to Matthew 21. Real quick, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And verse number 19. Matthew 21, verse 19, this is talking about Jesus. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? So when Jesus sees, he goes, he wants, he wants to go get some figs from this fig tree. So he goes up to it and he sees there's no fruit on it. So he's like, you know what? There's no fruit on you. Let no fruit grow on you henceforth forever. So from now on, there's going to be no fruit that comes out of you. And obviously, there's a lot of, of, of extra meaning that goes into this event, but I'm not going to get into that tonight. And it says, and presently the fig tree withered away. So as soon as he says that, the fig tree just, just withers. And the disciples see this, and they're like, wow. They're like, that, that happened really fast. You know, your curse on that tree just happened. And Jesus answered them in verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now, obviously I'm going through this to help you with your prayer life. Because we saw in 1 John chapter 5 and in, 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 the, in Matthew here, you know, we need to ask one according to his will. We need to be able to ask God according to what he, we know that he wants for us. 
This is his plan for us. When we ask him things in that manner that, that are according to his will, of course, you know, is it God's will that you're going to be, you know, driving a, a Ferrari and living in a multi-million, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. It actually says the contrary. It says, you know, not to, not to be worried, you know, not to lay up treasures for yourself on earth. That that's not what, what our goal is. That's not his will for your life. So when you ask a, a prayer like that, is God going to hear that prayer? Is he going to answer that prayer? No. That's not according to his will. We can see it very clearly from the Bible that it's not according to his will. But when we ask other, other um, requests of God that is according to God, you know, help me to understand this passage. Help me to know more about your word. Help me to be able to have the boldness to preach the gospel on other people. God, help me in this area. You know, those are all things according to his will. We can have confidence, and we ought to not only have confidence, but have the faith, as Jesus said, to know that he'll do that for us. To, to, to have the, the assurance that this is what God wants for me. And have that believing, have that faith, and just knowing that God is completely powerful, and this is what he wants, and he will answer my prayer. And that's what he's explaining here with the fig tree. Like, you know, it, it was, it was a, a wonder for them. Wow, this fig tree just, just withered so fast. And he's saying, you think that was something? He says, if you ask, and don't doubt, and you, and you are confident, you're believing, and you know that this is right, you can say to that mountain, be you know, I mean, this is just a little fig tree. You can say unto a mountain, be, be removed. And the mountain will just will move out of its place. That obviously requires faith because that's something in our own wisdom, in our own understanding, is impossible. Well, we see in the story, Jacob is faced with an impossible situation. Now, he has some substance. He has some servants, you know, people looking over the flock and the cattle and stuff. But he doesn't have an army. He doesn't have the ability to face 400 men with that Esau has coming against him. It's, it's, a, it's an impossibility, but he goes to God in faith, and the reason why he has so much confidence is because he's able to quote God's word back to him. He's able to say, God, you said this. And we ought to be mindful of that. That will help you with your prayers when you know God's word enough to say, you know what, I know this is right. Just like when I was start, when, before I started this church, before... Um, I was sent out and I, I wanted to be a pastor. I was, when I was praying to God, part of my prayer to Him, and this is my personal prayer, I'll open up a little bit, but I would pray to God because I wanted to do what He wants for me to do with my life. That's what I want to do. Not everybody is, is called or, or God wants every single person to be a pastor, even if you are called by it. It's not necessarily what He wants you to do. So my prayer was, God, this is my intention. I see in the Bible that if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. And I want to do this, God. And this is what I want to do. And this is the way I'm planning on doing it. And my prayer to God was just, God, you know, if this isn't your will, because I want your will to be done, please make it so that this doesn't happen. But I know that, that you need and you want more pastors out there that are willing to, to give up themselves and their lives in order to further the gospel, in order to spread the truth, in order, in order to, to be able to preach, God. And, and I don't have much, but whatever I have, I'm willing to give to you, and I just want you to guide me. And that was the way, one of the ways that, that I was praying unto God, because it was knowing, knowing the scripture, knowing that God wants there to be a bishop. And if, if that is something you desire, that it is a good work. That is something that's right. So my prayer was, just, God, you know, make this not happen. You know, make my fine, you know, if it makes my finances crumble, whatever, so that I can't move, whatever it takes, God. If this isn't what you want me to do, then, then, you know, make sure that that it doesn't happen. Because I, my, my biggest concern is that I'm doing things according to your will. But from everything that I can see in my understanding, this is right. And after that, and and looking back now, it's a lot easier on everything that happened and all the circumstances that happened and and to get us to where we are, the place we're at, specifically the street we're on, the house we're in, and the way everything has worked out, I have zero doubt that God's hand has been in this. And, and I can see that, but it's easier in hindsight. It's easier after reading the rest of the chapter that Esau doesn't do anything to Jacob. Right? It's easier after the fact. But going into it, 
That's when you need to have the faith. That when, when, you're, when you're faced with these decisions, when you're faced with these problems or whatever it is that arise, even something that seems impossible, we need to have that faith and we need to know how to go to God. And, and you know, when you know, his, when you know something's right in the Bible, that should give you the more confidence that what you're doing you know, should be right. If you're, going to, if you're willing to go to God and say, God, this is what your word says and this is what I'm doing, you can absolutely have the confidence that he's going to hear you. Let's keep reading in uh, Genesis, back in Genesis chapter 32. And so, yeah, in verse 13, it says that he, um, you know, he decides to make a present. And turn, if you would, to Proverbs 19. And it lists up, you know, he's going to give them all these she-goats and he-goats and ewes and, and rams and all, you know, all these animals as, as a gift. And basically what he does is he splits them up into droves. And he's saying, okay, you're going to go first, and then you're, you know, set a space between you, and then you're going to be next, and then you're going to be next, and then you're going to be next. So that when Esau comes, he's going to come across these people. And he's going to say, like, who are you? We are like, like, who's are all these, these animals? You know, what are you doing? And he, he instructs them to respond in verse 18. Then thou shalt say, they be thy servant Jacob. Say, so this belongs to Jacob. It is a present sent unto my Lord Esau, and behold, also he is behind us. So every time he meets one of these groups of people that have these, these various animals that he's giving as a gift, he keeps telling them, okay, every time he runs across you, he's going to tell them, hey, this is all Jacob's stuff, but he's giving it as a gift to you. So obviously the intention is to soften him up a little bit. As he's seeing all these different things and he's receiving these gifts, you know, hopefully he can change his mind before he even confronts them so there's not this big confrontation. And it's very wise. It's, it's a very smart thing to do. In Proverbs 19, look at verse number 6. Proverbs 19, 6 reads, Many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. Mommy. Of course, Proverbs is the book of wisdom. He's saying, look, <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's absolutely true. Who's not friends with someone? You know, if you know someone and is, they're always giving stuff out, they're always giving Mommy. gifts, they're always, you know, free with their money or free with food or free with anything, you know, it's like, he's got a lot of friends. Now, they may not necessarily be true friends or loyal friends, but hey, they're going to talk nicely to him, you know, they're not going to be causing problems with them. So he's taking this wisdom and saying, you know what, I'm going to start giving them all these gifts because I don't want him angry with them. So when he starts to receive all this stuff, it's going it's to soften him up a little bit. He's going to see, okay, you know, and, and for all we know, like we don't know, the Bible's not clear on his intentions. I think, personally, I think that these gifts probably did appease Esau. Because I can't think of any other real good reason why he would bring 400 people you know, to, see, to see Jacob. And I think what he did here was really wise. Now, obviously, God had his hand in the whole thing, and God wouldn't have allowed um, Esau to harm him because he was doing the Lord's will, and he was there to protect him anyways. And he already saw the angels. He knew that they were there to, to help him out. But I do think also that what Jacob did here was very smart in preparing all of these, um, these presents for his brother. In verse 20 it says, And he say ye moreover, Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he will accept him. So that's his, that's his plan. Obviously we see that it works, but he, had, he sets this whole plan up into action, and then the night before he's actually going to meet him, look at, we're going to start reading here in verse number 21. So went the present over before him, and himself lodged that night in the company. And he rose up that night, and took his two wives, and his two women servants, and his eleven sons, and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them, and sent them over the brook, and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. So he sends everybody up. In front of him, he said he sets him over this, this river, he crosses a fort, and, um, and Jacob stays alone by himself. And verse 24 says, And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Now, if things aren't going right for Jacob, I mean, he just had that, he just squeaked by with Laban. Now he's getting ready to, to, to face Esau, and he's, you know, he's praying unto God. He's got all this stress and all this turmoil going on. 
he's all by himself, and what happens? Some guy, like, jumps him or whatever because he starts wrestling with somebody, right? It's the middle of the night. He's probably just praying unto God. He's upset. He's not knowing, not sure what's going to happen to him. And it says here, and they wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now, again, we don't know exactly uh, what time this took place. We know it was at night. But anyone who's actually done some wrestling, now I never did a lot of wrestling, but I did, I did a little bit. You do like 30 seconds of wrestling? <laughs> that really drains you. Wrestling is a very, very difficult sport. It's just, or even if you're not doing it for sport, if you're wrestling because you're fighting somebody, that takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of strength. It takes a lot of endurance to be able to wrestle. And what we see, one of the things we learn about Jacob here is how strong and tough he really is. And don't forget, too, by this time, Jacob is much older. And I, and I don't know, I, I'd have to go back and look at the years. I, I didn't have this prepared in my notes. But his brother Esau already had his wives. And remember, they're, they're twins, right? So they're the same age. And we can look back and see how old, I think, how old he was at that point. But he's already been gone for 20 years, even since then. And he was already an adult and a grown man because his brother Esau had already had two wives before he even left, right? So I want to say he's like in his 60s by this point when he's coming back and he's wrestling. And he's wrestling at least long enough until the breaking of the day. So if you've wrestled for 30 seconds or a minute, you know, you get wiped out real fast. He was wrestling for an extended period of time. And not only did he wrestle for a long time, look at verse 25. And this can be a little bit confusing because it uses a lot of pronouns. It uses a lot of he, 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 so you don't know exactly who it's talking about at first. It says that when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. But then it says, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So, Basically, what happens here is that Jacob's winning this, this wrestling match. So the, the person that he's wrestling against then, then touches the hollow of his thigh and makes his thigh out of joint. And he continues to wrestle. Look at this in verse 26. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And this is the one, you know, the, the person who Jacob is wrestling against. He's saying, look, it's, you know, dawn's about here. Let me go. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with man, and hast prevailed. And we're going to get into the rest of this chapter in just a minute. But um, he wrestles. His thigh gets out of joint. And he's still, not only is he continuing to fight and wrestle, but he's still winning. Now, when you get, I mean, think about how much pain that must have been, too. Because we see later at the end, um, in verse 31, and as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Like, like he was hurt. You know, he was injured. He was, you know, limping away or whatever. To be wrestling for that long, and the determination, too, to not give up. Even when you're hurt, I mean, when you get injured when you're fighting or something, man, that's, that's tough. And not to get knocked out. All that to say, you know, Jacob was a really tough guy. And, and, and he really went through a lot. And one thing I think that people might be a little bit confused about because is, is who is he wrestling? Who is this guy? Who is that he was wrestling against? Well, Jacob himself said in verse 30, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. According to Jacob, he was wrestling with God. Now, I believe that, and the reason why is this. The person who he's wrestling against, in verse 28 it says, And thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. And that reference about him prevailing is to his wrestling. I mean, he, the, just as this wrestling match is over, he asks for a blessing, 
and he said, and he changes his name from Jacob to Israel, and he says, because you prevail, you know, you're a prince, because you prevailed against God and men. And what I believe this is, this is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. And which makes sense because we've seen this before. When you look at Melchizedek, and we went over this in previous chapters, Melchizedek in Hebrew says that he was without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Abide of the priest continually, right? Melchizedek is someone who didn't have parents. He was, he was God, right? Yes. And he received blessing. We went over that whole thing in the previous chapters. But um, we have that. We have the appearance of... Um, Remember with Shad, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and, and Daniel, when they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace? And the king said, he's like, well, wait, you know, didn't we throw three men in there? He's like, but I see four loose walking around, they have no hurt, and the fourth is like the Son of God. Right, so there we see another appearance. And, you know, the fact that we see here just plainly saying that you have power with God with men and has prevailed. And Jacob saying, I've seen God face to face. Now, I don't believe it was the Lord because the Bible also says that no one is, no man has seen the Lord face to face. You know, no man can see the Lord and live. No. So the Father part of the Godhead, nobody has seen him. And that lines up with, remember when, when Moses wanted to see him? He, he put him in the cave or whatever. He passed by and he said, well, you can't see my face, but you can see, he let him see his hinder parts. So the Lord that was speaking with him, you know, he passed by, he was able to see his hinder parts, but not able to see his face. And, and the Bible says that no one has seen God at any time. No one has, has seen God face to face, as in God the Father, the Lord. But Jesus Christ, obviously people have seen, people have seen the Son, people saw him when he walked around this earth, and people saw Melchizedek, and, and, and here we see he was wrestling with them. So, I believe absolutely this is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ, and he was wrestling with Jacob. Now, another thing that's interesting about this is, you know, he pushed Jacob to the limit in this wrestling. Because you say, well, wait a minute. If he's wrestling against God, if this is even Jesus Christ, if you, how is it that he can win? Right? I mean, God can beat anybody. Yeah. So how is it even possible that Jacob's going to win if he's wrestling against God? Well, the reason isn't because it was impossible for God to win the wrestling match, obviously. But if you think about it in this terms, too, it makes it makes some sense. There's a reason for it, right? There's, there's a purpose for his wrestling. And obviously, there's, there's a lot more wisdom behind this as well in, that we can make applications of this event with our own wrestlings when, when we're wrestling and maybe we're wrestling against God or we wrestle against... Um, adversaries that are real strong and formidable and powerful, but to have this type of de determination and, um, you know, that Jacob showed here. There's a lot we can apply to this, but um, when you think about with your own children, right? If you're saved, you're a child of God. And I don't have any sons, I have daughters, but, you know, oftentimes with parents, with their children, what you'll do when you're, you know, if you have a son and you're wrestling, you don't always just win every time. Right? You could be playing games. You could have races. You could do all kinds of different types of competition things. Right? And as a father, when you're doing, when you're doing those games with your children, sometimes you let them win. Right? Because you, you want them to feel good. But I'll tell you what, whenever we do races and stuff, I don't just, just make it, you know, it's never, it's never like obvious, right, that they're just going to win. Right? That they're just, like I'm just not doing anything. Right? I make them work for it. I'll stay up right with them the whole time. And sometimes I'll win and sometimes they'll win. But it's the, it's the, the, the pushing them and the challenge and getting them to, to really work at it and, this, and, to, and to fight for it. Right? There's, there's something being taught there. And, you know, as a father with a son, I believe if God's wrestling with them, you know, of course God could win. But he lets Jacob win in this scenario. But he makes him give it everything that he has. Right? So I don't... Just, be, you know, uh, just in case you're thinking, like, well, of course, it can't be God because there's no way that God would lose in a wrestling match. Like, well, of course, unless he, he is throwing the fight. You know, he's throwing the wrestling match on purpose because he's strengthening Jacob's character. And also what we see here, there's even, there's even a much bigger picture going on when Jacob 
ask for a blessing. Because if you remember, obviously we went over this in detail quite a bit. It's not just a coincidence that here that Jacob wants a blessing, just as with Isaac he wanted a blessing. He wanted his brothers, he wanted the blessing of, of Esau. But then he went deceitfully. Then he went at guile and he tricked and, and he even said, remember Isaac asked him specifically, who is this? He said, this is, this is thy firstborn, it's Esau. And he asked him, he's like, who was it? Wait a minute, are you sure? He said, well, come here and let me feel you and let me see. And he specifically said his name was not Esau. But this time, when he wants a blessing, he's willing to his wife, he said, well, you know, when he's told, he said, hey, you know, let me go, the day's breaking. He says, I'm not going to let you go except thou bless me. I want a blessing. You need to sit down. And then he was asked, well, what is thy name? And this time, he tells the truth. This time, he tells him Jacob. Now, you remember when Esau said his name is rightly called Jacob, for he hath deceived me these two times. The name Jacob is, is, means he's a deceiver. And that name came, if you remember, when, when he stuck his hand out first. They thought he was going to be the firstborn. And then his hand came back in, and then Esau was born, because they, they wrapped the thread around Jacob's hand. And he really wasn't the firstborn, and then Esau came out first, and he was the firstborn. And that's kind of where that name came from. But, but Esau was even saying that, you know, he's deceived me already a couple times. His name is rightfully called Jacob. So now, he's grown quite a bit. He's matured. He's, he's, he's found God. He's put his faith in the Lord. He didn't have his faith in the Lord before. We saw him make that vow. He said, look, God, if you're going to be with me, then you'll be my God. When he's going to Laban's family, when he's leaving his father's his place, that's when he kind of comes to God. So now he's come to God. Now he's, he's already reaped what he's sown from his deceivings and everything else. He's learned to become a very hard worker. And the reason why he's even able to wrestle for as long and, and, and as arduously as he did, and even when he's hurt to continue to, to, to wrestle and prevail, is because he's a hard worker. Because he worked so hard. I mean, he's not going down to the gym and, and pumping iron. He's working hard. And he's gaining that strength just from his labor, just, just from all the work that he's done to be able to, to have a wrestling match like this. So he's grown quite a bit. Now God says, okay, you know what? Jacob is no longer defines who you are. You are no longer Jacob. You've grown into somebody else. You've grown into Israel. And that name Israel, of course, means a prince. He says, because you have become, we're right here in verse 28, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And um, it's not a coincidence at all, all of the things that happened there. And it's, and it's related back to when he was deceiving Isaac for that blessing. Now, his name being changed to, to Israel is important because names in the Bible always carry a meaning. These days we're kind of, we don't put as much emphasis on, on people's names, probably not as much as we should, because all throughout Scripture we find so much importance. Think about everybody's names that were changed in the Bible. Abram, right, was called Abraham. Sarai was changed to Sarah. You think of... Um, Simon Peter, his name was Simon before, Jesus changed his name to Peter, Cephas, right? They both mean the same thing. Peter and Cephas means a stone. Um, Saul, the apostle Paul, his name was Saul, and then his name became Paul later. There's all these people that have had these transitions where they were identified a certain way before, and maybe properly identified a certain way before, but then they reached a point in their life when they changed. And when they started doing things for God, doing things right, and, and they, they, they took on a new name. Now, the Bible says that God is going to give us a new name. We're going to close with this. Turn if you would to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2.
And look at verse 17 of Revelation chapter number 2. The Bible reads, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So this is talking about, you know, it's who, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that hath faith, right? It's our faith that, that overcomes. So he that overcometh is he that has faith. It's he that's born again. It's he that's saved. So to him that overcometh, we're going to receive a stone. God's going to give you a stone. It's going to have a new name written on it. No one's going to know that name but you and God. And I often wonder, what is that name going to be? Right? Names always have meaning throughout the Bible. God's going to give you a name, I believe, based on who you are. Now, I don't know about you, but I want that name to be something strong and solid and, and something that would represent, like here, Israel, a prince. Right? To have power with God and with men. That's a great name. Something that represents, hey, you've done you know, a lot of soul winning, you've done a lot of things with your life, and now this is your name and this is how I know you as. You're no longer the person you were before. We need to decide, who are you going to be? What name are you going to strive for? Because that who you are, then that, that name will just identify who you are. If you become that person, the name is only going to be fitting for you. Flip back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 32. We're going to just read the rest of the chapter and close. But, but think about that, because you will get a new name. This is something that's going to happen in the future. And hopefully it's not going to be like lazy or, you know, proud or anything like that, right? Hopefully you get a good name that, uh, that's going to be some good attributes that you, that you would be happy to have as that's, that's how you're identified as. Let's keep reading here. Uh, verse... 30, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Therefore, look at the last verse, verse 32, therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. You might say, well, that's kind of weird. Why would they no longer then eat of that specific sinew just because it shrank in, in Jacob's thigh. Well, the, the answer is real simple. It's just because, you know, this is how they, you know, they create a tradition because it carries a meaning. And this way they can carry on this story because this, this is a big event that happened to Jacob, right? I mean, his name has changed to Israel. This is quite an amazing story. And they're able to pass this story on through a tradition like this. And, you know, because one day a kid's going to be like, well, wait. How come, how come we don't eat this? Right? How, how come this is set apart and separate? Why, why is that? And ask the question, why do we do things this way? And then they can bring up this story and say, oh, well, because when Jacob wrestled with God, you know, he touched his thigh and, and, it's, you know, and go through the whole story of how Jacob even became Israel. And, um, you know, of course, these days we have the ease of books and printing presses and every, you know it's real simple it's real cheap it's real affordable to get written word but um, back in, in these days it wasn't like that it wasn't so easy to transmit the you know stories and, and have them you know pass down as easily um, so it was more oral and in memory and, and passed on orally as opposed to through written word let's bow our eyes in a word of prayer dear heavenly father lord we thank you so much for the Bible, we thank you for this great story um, regarding Jacob and, and all the different trials and tribulations he had to face, God. Uh, I pray that we, we know that if we're living godly, that we will face trials and tribulations, and you promise that that's going to happen. But I pray that you would please just be with us. We pray that you would please send your angels to minister unto us and to protect us, dear Lord, to protect us and our families from evil and from those that would be out to harm us. And that you would just lead us and direct us and guide us 
We're here as your willing servants, dear Lord, to do your will. Please watch over us every step of the way, Lord, and, and just help us to have the, the knowledge that we need to be able to go to you boldly and in much faith when we go to you in prayer, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.